action. Mr. Tuba, activate the photonic. Also known as Captain Foley from Trek Yards, we have a web series on YouTube. We have a TOS captain's chair downstairs. So if you get an opportunity, come and get your picture in the chair and uh, have some fun. I want to start off by saying uh, no recording um, of the panel, except for people with permission. And uh, yeah, as a lifelong Star Trek fan, it's my honor to say these words. Computer, activate EMH. Welcome, Mr. Robert Picardo, everybody. Thank you, Captain. Well, you're welcome, Doctor. Um, so, is this your first time to London, Ontario? This, this is my first time to London, Ontario, yes. And it's, uh, frankly, with all the traffic jam today in London, England, it's a better place to be, I understand. I mean, you don't, you don't have a, uh, a royal burial, but you do have a marathon today, I think, right? Yeah, we've got a few things going on, apparently. So there's a lot happening today. So thank you for choosing to be here instead of running in the marathon. And I appreciate that. Now, have you been here just a few days? Have you gone around and seen any of the sites or anything? Um, I have been here most of the time, but I did go to the same Indian restaurant twice for dinner because the food was so good. So Very that's nice. the only place that I've really seen. Very nice. Well, I mean, welcome to London, Ontario, then. Thank you. The people are, uh, I'm sure you hear this all the time, everybody's been very friendly. I went into a convenience store and the man uh, liked me right off the bat and asked if I wanted to move here. <laughs> so I thought that I made an instant impression with him. That's great. Well, um, I know on your IMDb you have over like 300 t uh, credits. So do you want to tell us a little about stuff that's been going on lately with you? Sure. Um, I have, uh, I've had a fairly uh, busy year. For example, um, in the spring I, I did a, a werewolf movie called Werewolf Game based on the parlor game. Has anyone ever played Werewolf? The game where uh, you have, yeah, part of your group are secret werewolves and they're going to kill the villagers and you have to vote at the end of every round who you're going to kill and you might kill a secret werewolf or you... Well, ours is a real kind of bloody, scary horror movie with the great Tony Todd. You all know who Tony Todd is? He is the mysterious guy playing the game and I am uh, I'm one of the 12 contestants who may be a werewolf or may not. Um, I also did a, a vampire movie called Crimson Shadows, uh, sort of an LGBTQ themed my mother is a beautiful werewolf, about 30 years old, or actually she's 250 years old, but looks about 30. And she has an aging son who's dying of cancer, who's not a vampire. I'm sorry, so mom is a vampire, the son is not a vampire. It's actually a very good script. And I, uh, so my point is, I've done a werewolf movie and a vampire movie. If I do a zombie movie this year, I've made the trifecta. In the same way that I've played a regular character on Star Trek and a regular character on Stargate, if I'm ever in Star Wars, I've made the trifecta. So there are a couple of things I'm angling for for the future, just so I can, you know, complete the circle. I also uh, guest starred on C uh, CS CSI Vegas. Can tell you if I'm the killer or a red herring. Uh, I'm on a show called Mythic Quest for their season finale. Um, so I have been a, I've been a relatively busy. Also during the pandemic, I started my own YouTube channel. And I do different characters. I do an original video every week. So you should look for the Robert Picardo official YouTube channel. Some of my characters are the world's oldest gigolo and most self-absorbed man. <laughs> Alfonso, he can offend anyone, male or female. I play a, a character called the telepathic composer who looks like an old hippie. He has the power to put music in your head, whether you like it or not. I play a, a very stupid detective who can't solve anything. 
and I also play a female character named Eva Wagner. She is a, a, a former opera star and is now writing a book about her life that is, no one wants to read. Um, so I play all these silly characters to keep me from going insane during the pandemic lockdown. And I fell in love with doing them, so even though I don't have to do them anymore, because I'm back to regular acting, those are the, what are those guys? The predators, yeah. Oh yeah, the Predators were chasing me through uh, yesterday. <laughs> In fact, I made a video that will no doubt be on my official YouTube channel. Yeah. So if you want to be see me being chased by two Predators. So sometimes it's things happening in my life. I also do, I recreate, these are the most popular videos, I have to admit. I recreate scenes from Voyager, or classic Voyager techno babble in beautiful earthly settings. And those series are called Techno Babel Al Fresco. So if you want to see me redoing scenes from Voyager um, out, out in beautiful places around the world, I recommend you uh, visit the official Robert Picardo YouTube channel. You should come down to the TOS captain's chair and do a scene in that. I'm going to visit the TOS captain's chair. I may do a scene, I have to think of it, I have to write it. <laughs> but I could be the emergency command hologram. I know yes. what I, I know what I could yes. say. Activate the photonic cannon. <laughs> and I'll come in and say, wrong ship. No, no, you come in, and no, as Mr. Tuvok, you have to say, activating the photonic cannon. That was one of my favorite Tuvok moments. He, He's trying to play along, but he knows we have no photonic cannon. <laughs> well, speaking of Star Trek, I know there's a lot of new Star Trek shows on right now. Not that you can tell us if you are, but is there any chance of the Doctor showing up in any of them? Because uh, they I, all have potential. There, I, there, are, uh, there are no plans for the Doctor's uh, on-screen uh, appearance in any of the present. Um, uh, whatever they are, Picard, Discovery, and uh, Lower Decks, and, and Lower Decks. I mean, well, there's always a chance with uh, animation, yeah. but there is nothing uh, that's happening uh, at the moment. So keep your eyes peeled. It's always when you play a popular character, it's always possible they'll revive you, but it ain't happening now. Boo, boo. We've been talking on Trek here. It'd be perfect for a lot to, to make a cameo for sure. So. But, uh, well, the fact that Jerry Ryan, uh, 7 of 9, is back is always hope for the future. But again, Picard has announced its last season, yeah. and I can tell you authoritatively, I am not in the third season of Picard. <laughs> not. Uh, but hopefully if there's a new iteration in the future, it's always, it's always possible because, because, unlike other television shows, your character never really goes away on Star Trek. I mean... As much as we all love the West Wing, I've never seen a West Wing convention, but there's something about science fiction where the audience is always open to those actors, the legacy uh, characters, uh, to come back. And, and that's, ha that's happening with the Next Generation cast, obviously, in full force with Star Trek Picard next season, where all of those wonderful actors will play their characters uh, from next gen. So in theory, if they ever decided to have, uh, if Kate Mulgrew were ever decide to, uh, that she wanted to return on camera and not just as a voice in uh, Prodigy, then anything is possible. It really depends on the enthusiasm and response of the loyal Star Trek fan base. Well, we'll be pushing for it. Hashtag bring back the doctor, everybody. Um, it's not like I went bald since I was on Voyager. Speaking of, I love the hat. You had a nice hat yesterday. You have an extensive hat collection, I take it. I, any bald man has an extensive hat collection. Great. I mean, unless, you know, I, I am open to promotional consideration if, you know, if the, if the uh, Royal Bank of Canada wants to rent this space. They're always welcome. Yeah, but I'm very identifiable on Google Maps. Every time I take my hat off, you know, up in space, they go, what's that shine down there? I see some, I see this, I see something in London, Ontario that I'm not used to. 
Oh, let me go dark. There we go. Now, you mentioned voice acting. I know you have a lot of voice credits to your uh, resume as well. Um, how do you approach voice acting differently to live action? I don't bathe when I act in voice acting. That's no, I'm kidding. Um, you, don't, you don't have to groom yourself as well, right? Uh, because often you're in the booth alone. If you're recording with a bunch of other actors, then I suggest you, you groom yourself accordingly. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I wish I did more animation. I tend to do video games, like uh, I'm in the Call of Duty Black Ops franchise, which is why I, I often play the villain in that. I play a character named Shadow Man. Um, and I've been in animated films. If you check, you know, the Page Master 40 years ago, you've got three generations of Star Trek actors in it. You have Patrick Stewart, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, myself, I think, I think someone else is in Page Master from Star Trek, but I can't remember now. That was even before I was ever on Star Trek. I was so I've been doing animated, uh, doing voice work for a while. I and I, I wish I did more. And frankly, I am starting to do more. So that's always that's always fun, especially if you can use your voice in a way where um, I can sound, I, I can play older characters, ancient characters, but I can also basically sound like I sounded on, on during my Star Trek years. So you get a much range, a larger range of, of characterizations. You can play, I can play down into my 30s vocally. So that's fun too, it's a, it's a trip down memory lane, you know. <laughs> Well, just like a week ago was Star Trek Day, and I saw you on, they, they talked to you before it started, and there's something I learned that I didn't know before, was that you were actually going to study microbiology? Not microbiology, just biology. Just biology? I, I, um, I went to a, uh, I was a very good student in high school, uh, and I went to Yale University uh, on a scholarship to, uh, and I was a biology major, because I intended to be a real doctor, not just a television doctor. And uh, my ambition was uh, pediatrics. So I was a biology major for basically my first two years at Yale. But I'd always acted in high school and in college for fun. And I was in a production at Yale that uh, kind of turned my head around. Uh, uh, Leonard Bernstein, the great uh, American composer, who wrote West Side Story, among many, many other things, uh, wrote a piece that, uh, that was commissioned for the opening of the Kennedy Center in Washington called The Mass, Leonard Bernstein's Mass. And uh, it had only been done, that one production, in Washington, D.C., but there was a young um, com conductor from the Yale School of Music named John Mosseri, and John, uh, asked Mr. Bernstein, he said, I don't think they did justice to your work here. I'd like to do a poor theater version of it at Yale. And Bernstein gave him permission to do it. And our production was so successful, Leonard Bernstein came to see it and decided to bring our production to premiere the work in Europe. So my college production, which I had a featured role in, was videotaped by public television for a series called Theater in America. And it's recently been made available some however many years later, 40 years later, it's on the internet. So I saw my production, my performance as a 19 year old with a giant head of hair, long gone. I have a huge afro, I, I, uh, it looks like, I look like a character from Godspell. But I had a very featured role in it. I sang what was called the Gospel Sermon, um, and my character was called the Gospel Preacher. And Bernstein thought very highly of my work. He wanted me to sing the lead in the show, which I wasn't trained for. That was really an opera role. But, um, but he said to me, You're, you have such natural energy on stage, not phony Broadway energy, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I'm studying to be a doctor. And he said, I'm surprised, I think you'd want to be an, a performer. You'd want to be an actor. And I looked Mr. Bernstein in the eye and said, 
would you tell that to my mother? <laughs> and he did. Opening night, Leonard Bernstein told my mother that he thought I should be an actor, and that got me out of pre-med and into show business. So I owe my career. And then I thought I'd be a musical theater actor. And of course, I, I was very fortunate. I went to New York. I, I did my first leading role on Broadway at 23 years old in a play called Gemini, but I didn't sing in it. However, my character was an opera, an opera fan. So where did that show up again years later? And then I, uh, right at, while I was in that show, I was sort of scouted for my second Broadway lead. I played the son of the great Jack Lemmon in a play called Tribute on Broadway at age 24. And that role brought me to Hollywood because we redid the play in Hollywood. With, so I worked a year with Jack Lemmon. So I had some, um, I really, I, I think the peak of my career was when I was 24 years old. <laughs> but I've been very, uh, I was very fortunate and then started to work in movies and television. And by the time I was cast in Star Trek, I, I'd had a whole prior career on Broadway, I had starred on a television series about China, be uh, about Vietnam, called China Beach. I think Great that show. when you're cast in Star Trek and it's your first major credit, I think sometimes that makes it hard to be seen in other roles. If you're if science fiction, if you become heavily identified with one character, but I was cast at 41 years old in Star Trek, and I had played many different roles. So Star Trek was a gift at that point in my life when you get a job like that in your 40s. You're sure, you're sure of one thing. You'll be able to send your children to college. <laughs> well, they're telling me that it's time to open up questions from the audience. So anyone have a question? No, whoa, right there, back there. By the way, that taking biology must have really helped with your lines in Voyager. Honestly, I, I think that when you, study, when you study science, you learn scientific reasoning. And Star Trek, even though it is, even though it's set in the 24th century, all of the science in Star Trek is based on real science, unlike that other science fiction franchise. When they asked Neil deGrasse Tyson, which do you prefer, the science of Star Trek? and the science of Star Wars. He said, science in Star Wars? What science? <laughs> so S Star Trek is based in real science. And when the doctor had a long speech, it, it obeyed the rules of scientific reasoning. Here is what I've, here's the empirical evidence I've observed. Here is how I'm going to construct a test and, and test my hypothesis I'm going to draw a conclusion and then I'm going to create a treatment protocol based on my analysis of the data. It always followed scientific logic. So do I think it helped that I'd been, a, you know, studied biology two years? I certainly do. I even caught them when they made mistakes sometimes. I'd have a line that said, um, the, first, the first cells to be attacked by the broad, uh, by the um, the uh, Borg nanoprobes, are the patient's blood cells, and I said it should be the first tissue to be attacked by the Borg nanopro nanoprobes is the patient's blood. Blood is a tissue, and they said, "Well, that sounds weird." I said, "I know, but technically." In biology, blood is considered a tissue, even though it's composed of cells. So they said, they would look it up and they go, okay, you're right. <laughs> and, and sometimes uh, on, they made mistakes on anatomy that I remembered were incorrect. Uh, because our, our wonderful science advisor, Andre Bormenis, was not a life scientist. He, he studied, you know, uh, ast astrophysics. So sometimes, you know, his biology was a little weak. So I think it helped a little bit. I just meant with pronunciation, but thank you for that answer. <laughs> All right. Questions? Yeah, I was just wondering, when you made an appearance on Star Trek First Contact, did you notice a big difference between Star Trek on the small screen as opposed to the big screen? 
Did I know the difference? You notice a big difference. Like, just how well, was it? My nose looked a lot bigger. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, it was fun. It was fun to be in that movie. I still think it's one of the best Star Trek movies. Um, can I tell quickly the story of how I ended up being in the movie? Yeah, that should be interesting. Okay. Um, all right. I knew they were making a Star Trek movie. I knew they had destroyed the Enterprise at the end of Star Trek VI. Generations had crashed into the ice plant. So I'm in the office of our executive producer, Rick Berman, to talk about something else. And on my way out the door, just like Columbo when he would scratch his head when he was leaving, he'd, I said, uh, you guys, you're writing the script for the next Star Trek feature. And he said, yeah, Brandon Braga and Ron Moore were writing it. I said, I don't understand something. How come the Voyager has more advanced technology than your flagship, the Enterprise? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, how come Voyager has this emergency medical hologram program and the Enterprise doesn't have one. And he laughed, and I said, I'm not trying to pad my part, I'm just looking out for your logic here. And he said, that's a very interesting idea. Okay, two weeks later I had lunch with Ron Moore, one of the people writing the script. I did the same thing again. You're writing, you and Brandon are writing the new script for the new movie, I said. I said, how come, uh, how come Voyager has more advanced technology than the Enterprise, what do you mean? And I walked him through the whole thing again, and he said, that's a very interesting idea. A week later, I'm in Brandon Braga's office, who is one of our showrunners on Voyager, talking about something else. On my way out the door, you're writing the new Star Trek movie with Ron Moore, aren't you? And he said, yeah. I said, well, how come? Now, I don't understand something. How, you know, and I did the whole thing again. All right. Five weeks go by. Jonathan Frakes calls me on the phone in my trailer and says, I want to thank you. I'm directing the next Star Trek feature. I said, that's incredible. He said, I want to thank you because I was approved by showing the episodes, the episode projections, which was the Voyager episode, my first one I directed, that is entirely your character. Right. And I said, well, thank you. That's very kind. I'm sure I had nothing to do with it. But you know what? I don't understand something. <laughs> And I did the whole thing again to him. And he went, that's a, that's a very interesting idea. Okay. A month later, I get a phone call. And Rick Berman, our exec, says, we have decided to put the EMH in the new Star Trek movie. And I said, that's a very interesting idea. <laughs> that's great. Any other questions up here? Um, what's your what's your favorite Voyager episode? Favorite Voyager episode? Well, we get asked this a lot. It's hard to pick one, but if I had to pick one, I would say Tinker, Tenor, Doctor, Spy. Yes. In which the doctor changes his program so that he has the capacity to daydream and that he cannot stop daydreaming. My runners up are someone to watch over me, the, the My Fair Lady episode where the doctor is grooming Seven of Nine on how to behave on a date and he falls in love with her. And then maybe my third favorite is a dramatic one called Latent Image, where the doctor has a program breakdown because he's sa in saving the life of Harry Kim, he feels he's condemned another crew member to death. And he thinks he's violated his Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. So those are about my three favorite that feature my character. I have many other favorite episodes that are ensemble ones or feature other characters. I particularly like our 100th episode um, that features Harry Kim, uh, the one, I can't believe, timeless, timeless. Uh, another question? First of all, welcome to London. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, my question is very similar to the other gentlemen's. Uh, we were super excited to see you on the Orville as well. So we were wonder. I was wondering, was that a very different feel? than the Star Trek set, and how did it feel to be back in a similar atmosphere? 
how did it feel to be back in science fiction? Or okay. Um, the question was my appearance uh, on the Orville. I made two appearances. One is like a cameo, uh, playing the, uh, the the father of one of the of the security officer, and and the second one uh, was a show that started out as kind of a family comedy. She goes home, and her and her father is a very overbearing, judgmental guy who can't believe his daughter went into security rather than uh, rather than academics because he's a stuffy academician. Um, and the show starts out as a comedy and then takes a very strange tone turn when the uh, when the neighbors played by John Billingsley flocks uh, turns out to be uh, enraged and unbalanced and is going to kill me for destroying his son's career because his son committed suicide after a bad review that my character gave of his son's work. That's roughly the plot. Well, first of all, the Orville, it's very different. It felt very different from working on Voyager. Seth MacFarlane is a genius. Uh, you know, I, he's amazing how much he gets done in one day what the rest of us couldn't do in a year. Uh, I was really happy to work with the director, John Kassar, who, because I was a huge fan of 24, and he directed so many of those. Um, and I wanted to work with Billingsley. It was, I thought the tone change in the script was very strange, but I thought it worked really well. I think with the Orville, I haven't seen season three yet, but I hear it's amazing, and I will watch it. I hear they're dealing with very serious issues, uh, some, um, uh, particularly, I, you know, what is an individual, uh, what individual entitlement like LGBTQ issues? Uh, and I think that a lot of people feel that it is closer to the original Star Trek saga than some of the newer Star Treks. I hear that from a lot of fans. So I was delighted to be on it. My shooting experience was great. I would love if they had me back. I think the fact that my daughter's character came back in the finale might be a good sign, season three. But also, um, it was it was great fun to work uh, to work on the show. Um, and I think I, I'm sure you all know that Seth pitched CBS Television to be the guy who ran the Star Trek franchise. And I think they were a little afraid. A, of his sense of humor, and perhaps B, of his other workload. I mean, he has so many other responsibilities. In any case, he went off and made his own version of Star Trek, and it's wildly successful. So, and I think it, it, it really, I, I'm sure that different studios feel differently because they look at their bottom line, and they're concerned if anybody is taking a nickel away from them. But let's face it. All, good science fiction raises all boats. I think the fact that people love the Orville, who also love Star Trek, unless the Orville completely takes the Star Trek audience away, and I don't really see that happening, I think it's a good thing that, that Star Trek lovers love the Orville, and maybe people who start out on the Orville will eventually be brought to the Star Trek franchise. I think good science fiction is all good for science fiction fans and for actors who worked in science fiction. Absolutely. Do we have any other questions? Got a few. Hi, I'm a, a big over here. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience uh, working with Joe Dante on his films and what that was like for you, how you came to know him, and uh, obviously he liked you a lot because you were in most of his films, I believe, so if you uh, describe a little bit about that, I'd be very interested to know. Thank you. The question's about my longtime professional uh, friendship with Joe Dante. Joe Dante saw me in the play with Jack Lemmon, where I played Jack Lemmon's angry son, and he must have went 
there's my werewolf, because he had me into audition for The Howling. I remember scaring the casting director enough that they cast me in The Howling. I always loved horror movies growing up, so I was happy to be in The Howling. It's, I consider it a kind of a classic. Uh, it's now 40 years old. I was 26 or 27 when I did it. And they re-released The Howling last year on Blu-ray Blu disc, and it looks better than it ever did. Um, and then Joe, I, because I made so many jokes on the set while we were waiting for the makeup effects, Joe got a sense of my sense of humor, which he didn't know about. And thereafter, he cast me in Explorers, where I play three different roles, two of them in heavy makeup, where much of the comedy was improvised. And Joe's one of those directors that really likes to work with actors that he knows. And he's joked in the past when he did not know how to cast a role, he would just give it to me, like the cowboy in Inner Space, who is supposed to be a scary character, but you really want him to be funny. Joe told me when I auditioned, because I had to audition for Spielberg, I had to shoot an audition, he said, I don't know if you've ever heard Joe Dante talk, he talks like this. He goes, well, Stephen thinks the character should be funny, you know? And I think, eh, eh, you know, I think he's, I mean, Stephen thinks he should be scary, and I think he should be funny. So we gotta fool Stephen to think he's gonna be scary, and then we'll do what we want. So, so I had to make a scary audition for Spielberg. But in it, when I played a very ominous character, I had no dialogue. The cowboy had four or five scripted lines, and I made up things. And some of the lines I made up ended up in the movie. But when I did the medley of country western songs in character, this is a great country. <laughs> what I love about this country is the music. Here are some of my favorite American songs. I got spurs that yingle, yingle, yingle. And I did a uh, happy, I did I'm an old cow hand, yippee oh And I just did silly songs in a funny accent, and that's how the song ended up in the movie. So it got to the point where Joe just trusted me. He would pick a, por a part for me in the movie. And whether it was a big part or a small part, I always said yes. The only time I said no to Joe was Gremlins. <laughs> he was gonna create a, a, a one scene part for me in Gremlins and I didn't know him well enough. And I said to my agent, do I have any lines? And the agent said, I'm not sure. And I turned him down and he was mad at me for a whole year. But now I say yes to anything. Then in Gremlins 2 came along. In Gremlins 2, I got a big part, lots of lines, and, and that beautiful hair. If you want to see the Gremlins 2 wig, it appears on my official YouTube channel on the head of the world's oldest gigolo, Alfonso. That is the 35-year-old Gremlins 2 hair, still working. <laughs> All right, questions? Got another one? What do you think is the best thing about Star Trek? Um, well, I'm going to give you the, the classic answer. The best thing about Star Trek is its optimism. Um, there's, ever since 9-11, there's been a lot of very bleak and pessimistic and apocalyptic science fiction where the world has been destroyed and there are a few stragglers trying to survive. But Star Trek envisions a future that is very successful for humanity. An optimistic future where science and technology empower humanity without destroying it. And where gathering knowledge and understanding about our place in the cosmos is reason enough to go out and explore space. We don't need to mine space for precious metals to make more cell phones. We need to go out in space to understand ourselves better. And we need to search for evidence of life in space to understand ourselves better. My friend Bill Nye, the science guy who's the CEO of the Planetary Society, an organization which I have worked with for 25 years, 
Um, it's the world's largest space advocacy group. If you are a fan of space and you want to join a community of people like you, I encourage you to join the Planetary Society. Um, my friend Bill Nye says, if we discover evidence of life off of our planet, even microbial life on Mars, or, or evidence of prior microbial life on Mars or a moon of Jupiter, it will fundamentally change the way we see ourselves. It'll change every person on this planet. And that's why we explore space, and that's why Star Trek is so great, because it teaches us that going out and learning by extending the human presence across the galaxy that is reason enough just to understand ourselves more deeply and that's what makes it great optimistic science fiction and we have time for one last question ah thank you very much um i guess my question it seems a little bit trite after such great questions and answers we've had so far but uh my question is which of the other Star Trek science or medical officers do you think the doctor would have gotten along with best, and which do you think might have rubbed him the wrong way a little bit, or he would kind of chafe against? That's a great question. It is a really good question. I mean, presumably, uh, I think he would have gotten along best with Bones, with DeForest Kelly's character, because Dr. McCoy, in many ways, was the most like the doctor. He was a curmudgeon, he had his own uh, sense of humor, and he could get a little prickly sometimes. I had the great pleasure of meeting DeForest Kelly and hanging out with him on a couple of occasions, appearing on stage with him. Wonderful man, true gentleman, very funny. At the first convention we appeared at, my show had just premiered and I was the headliner at the event. He went on before me and he said, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a hologram. <laughs> so he won my heart immediately. So on the other hand, because they're both curmudgeons, perhaps they would have had a prickly relationship, but ultimately I would think that McCoy, he would have gotten along with best. Dr. Phlox, yeah, I don't know might be a little too uh it might be he might have been a little too perky for him the same way neelix was um and uh dr crusher i don't know i don't know how he would i really think mccoy was his natural uh affinity um so th probably they would have worked together the best and remember this is important that all of the McCoy's medical experience was part of the doctor's programming. So the doctor's personal database was based on McCoy plus 23 other Starfleet physicians. And I don't believe Dr. Crusher, Dr. Bashir, Dr. Flox were part of those. <laughs> all right, well I guess that's it for today. So thank you everybody. And thank, thank you, you. Robert Picardo for joining us. Everybody have a good Comic Con, and if you get a chance, come down and sit in the TOS Captain's chair. Go visit him at the booth. Come see me at my booth. I'm in the corner over there. <laughs> <laughs> Action, are you ready to go? Yep. Action. Two boxes. Activate the photonic cannon. Let's do one more. Uh, that gave me chills. <laughs> Ready? Action. Mr. Tuvok, activate the photonic.